So welcome to the retrospective of Polish cult comedies from communist times. Um, if you are joining me uh, again uh, and you were here yesterday that you will know already how it's going to work. Uh, so I will start with the organizational things and explain uh, what we're going to do today. But first, let me just say a happy Father's Day to all the fathers uh, that join us today. Um, so the way we're going to do it is uh, first um, I will have an introduction to the film and tell you a little bit about it. Uh, then I will give you a link to the program in which you will be watching the film. And I will give you the password as well. So you will just go to another website, watch the film, and then uh, after one hour and 22 minutes, uh, you will come back, um, actually maybe a little bit later, we will come back here at 8 p.m. Eastern time, um, and um, we will have Q&A. So there's a few things I need to tell you about the Q&A then. Um, at the bottom, you ha should have a Q&A uh, button right there. If you cannot see it in Zoom, just move your mouse and it should then be there, it should appear. So you can just cl click on it and ask a question uh, anytime. So um, if you, for example, during the film have a question, you can stop the film for a second, come back to Zoom, write the question in the box and then go back to watching the film. We will give you more time that the film lasts we will give you around an hour and a half uh, to watch it. Uh, and I will give you the time to stop, go back a little bit if you get lost, uh, if the subtitles go for too fast, for example, for you and you cannot read them, uh, uh, you can stop and go back a little bit. Um, so we will give you more time than the, the, the screening itself would take. Uh, and then we will go back exactly at eight sharp, as I said, and start the Q&A. Now, if you have any questions after uh, the film or after the event is finished, I would like you to email me. Here is my email address that I'm going to send now in the chat box. So you should be able to see it. Uh, you might have to copy it because after we finish the event, uh, it will disappear. So if you have any questions about the films or about um, humor in communism times, you can email me after the event is over and uh, you can expect me to reply after the retrospective is finished uh, next Saturday. You will also receive, uh, when the retrospective is finished, you will receive a survey by email. Uh, it will be just a few questions that I would like to ask you and you will only have to do it once. So even if you join few more events, I mean more films or all of them, uh, you will just be able to do it once, uh, just tick in which films you have seen with us. And then just answering a few, few, few simple short questions. Uh, so that will be sent to you after retrospective is over, which means actually next week. Uh, okay, the other thing I have to mention is the fact that we have a license for those films to show them in the USA. So if you are outside the USA, you will just, um, and if you're a Polish speaker, for example, then you can easily just find them somewhere else on YouTube, uh, or just, just Google where you can watch them online if you want to just refresh your memory. But only a people who are in the US will be able to watch them with us tonight. Um, so this is the most important part. Uh, I will give you the link and the password uh, a little bit later, so you don't start watching now, but first, uh, find out a little bit from me what this is all about. So uh, our retrospective about humor um, in communist times is, um, is part of my research studies that I'm doing for the Victims of Communist Memorial Foundation. And it's about the seeing how, how humor can be a tool of fight uh, with a regime. Um, George Orwell wrote, every joke is a tiny revolution. And um, Sigmund Freud believed that it allows people to express forbidden thoughts and therefore is a coping mechanism. Uh, but uh, academics from the field of uh, humor studies still disagree if you can fight a regime with a humor or is it just a, a peaceful form of protest or safety valve. So, um, 
in general, though, they all agree that in the Soviet bloc, the laughter was giving people the freedom, uh, the feeling of freedom and uh, the feeling of being together, bond forming and helping integration. So we can, uh, based on that, we can um, see that that helped them to realize they are not alone, that there is more people who doesn't agree with the system uh, and then feeling uh, that they are together, it was easier for them to, um, to organize and, and fight the regime. So uh, the way that um, the comedy in communist times worked, not just in Poland, but the all, in the all Soviet bloc was that at the very beginning, right after the war till mid fifties, uh, you were not able to make fun of the government, of the system at all. If you say a joke, um, even in a small company of friends as you thought, one of them could be an informer and uh, you could end up in jail um, in Siberia in a, in a camp and you might, you might even die. So it was not fun during St Stalin's life. There was a period of uh, terror and um, it was in, in Poland not really until the end of the 60s when uh, this kind of comedies were possible. So the comedies before that were made about the enemies of the system. So they were not laughing at the system, but with the system. And it was only uh, in 1970 when the film we showed yesterday, The Cruise, was released, that the situation has changed. And it was possible to change because the system with every decade was getting weaker and weaker. And uh, from killing people, uh, it would merely, or from killing a lot of people, it, it would go uh, to killing just a few. Um, and only when they were really, uh, you know, protesting in the streets. So by the end of the 80s, uh, it, the system was weaker and, and collapsed, but mostly because um, Russia um, was changing. And um, when the Soviet Union told all the communist country leaders that they will not uh, intervene if, if something happens, that was really the beginning of the end. Uh, because as soon as people realize and find out that, uh, you know, the, there was no stopping them. So let me just say a few more things about uh, Stanisław Bareja. Uh, Stanisław Bareja is the director of the film we're going to watch tonight, as well as the one we're going to watch tomorrow, after tomorrow, and the day after that. So we have four films by Bareja because he was the biggest and the most important director making cult comedies in communist times. He was the master of comedy and uh, the peak of his films were the 70s. And all the four films that we will see were made in the 70s. The last one was released in 1980, but was made a year earlier. So um, Barea really w didn't make any more films after that. He only made two TV series in the 80s. One of them was called uh, Four Alternatives, and the other one was Co-Drivers, Smienice. It was about two taxi drivers driving the same taxi 24-7. Uh, Those two TV series were also very popular, and um, right now, when we look back, uh, it's decided that um, these are like the best, the best films he, he, he made. Unfortunately, we were not able to show them because uh, there's more than 10 um, episodes uh, of al for alternatives and they are uh, almost one hour each. So, you know, that would last uh, a month. But um, if you ever heard about Krzysztof Kieślowski and his uh, TV series, The Decalogue or uh, The Ten Commandments, which make him famous, then it would be very interesting for you, if you've seen that one, to compare it. Uh, with uh, the alternative four, and even with Zmienicy as well, because both of them uh, would show, um, I mean, the Decalogue and the alternative uh, four, four alternatives, they would both show uh, Polish people in the end of the 80s, right before the system collapsed, uh, living in one um, block um, building and struggling with, uh, with life around them. So Kieślowski made his TV series um, in a very um, serious way. 
it was not a comedy at all. Uh, it was about hard choices that people had to make. Uh, and Varea took completely different approach. It was, it was funny, but it was still uh, deep uh, under, it was quite similar in, in really in the end. So uh, cinema, Polish cinema of the 80s uh, is famous for um, so-called uh, moral distrust um, style. And those two TV series were actually also uh, made in a way in that style. And now uh, Polish um, um, academics writing about film uh, realized that Barea in his uh, comedies was actually very, sh very close to Kieślowski, Wajda and other big uh, directors. And that his films, even though they were comedies, were actually showing the life the way it was. They were very down to earth. Some even say they were like documentaries because the, the, there was no real documentaries back then. Uh, everything was propaganda. So you could not really show real life. Uh, some directors tried, Kieślowski was one of them, to make documentaries that would be more um, truth, truthful to, to what was around them. But before that, that was completely impossible. And even after, um, Varea films just show uh, real life as it was happening. So even though they are feature films uh, and the stories are invented, they are based on, on real uh, life and everything that he was showing was really happening. So we see uh, long lines to buy food or furniture. Um, we see how people were willing and dealing to survive which was the case not just of Poland, but every, every communist country. So his films with time started to be appreciated because um, he actually started to make films in the 60s, but the films that the comedies he was making in the 60s were completely different. Um, they were pure inter entertainment. They were mm, full of songs and the dance numbers. And most of people was making fun of him that they are very light, a little bit stupid and you know that they were no good. There was even um, a word invented from his made of his last name Barea. It was called Bareism and at the very beginning uh, it, the meaning of that word was something uh, that was like just kitschy, not really you know art as other directors obviously in Poland back then wanted to make art films only and not you know, entertainment comedies. But with time, and now when we look back at his films, the word bareism uh, changed the meaning completely. Now it's the symbol of uh, absurd uh, reality and uh, things that we actually still sometimes see uh, around us. Uh, and he started to be much more uh, appreciated. So you will be able to see uh, four of his films. The first two, he did uh, with Jacek Federowicz, a comedian uh, who helped him to write the um, scripts for them as well. The other two he made with another comedian, Stanisław Tym. Those who watched The Cruise yesterday will recognize him. He was playing the leader yesterday. So those two, feel, uh, the first two and the other two will be a little bit different because uh, um, Federowicz wanted to make fun of the system um, but he was uh, show, uh, approaching it a little bit differently. It was more about kind of even slapstick comedy. The second film we will watch will remind you uh, Harold Lloyd films uh, in a way. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Stanisław Tim and the films that uh, Barea wrote and made with him will be more um, like a um, distorted mirror of the society. So you will be able to see the difference. And obviously in all of them, you have a story. And then there is a lot of uh, back stories, very short uh, episodes, when they just show what was life like um, in Poland. So we advertise the film that we're going to watch today, um, uh, Men, uh, Woman, Wanted, or Wanted, Men, Woman. Both titles actually uh, exist in English language. And uh, uh, we compared it uh, to uh, Mrs. Doubtfire. So uh, that would be a perfect film for Father's Day to watch. 
Uh, now, unfortunately, there are some uh, obviously similarities between the two films. Uh, the fact that a man dressed um, as a woman is one of them, but that's nothing new. Uh, that's not uh, obviously started with Mrs. Doubtfire either. We had some like it hot uh, before that. And even in the 30s in Poland, between the wars, uh, there was a comedy about uh, a, a woman dressing as a man. And this uh, idea was also used by Barea in his last TV series in the um, for drivers or Zmiennicy otherwise. That was a woman dressing as a man. In this one, we have a man dressed as a woman and working uh, as a um, housekeeper or, or um, here, here he won't be really um, as much taking care of children. There will be only one child in one of the families that he will work for. Uh, so this is the differences uh, now that we will talk about. And also this idea uh, of, of, um, of a man dressed as a woman, and we will find out why he did it in, in a moment. Um, here it was more just an excuse uh, to show the um, society of Poland in the beginning of 70s, um, different problems that were, that were there. Um, and yeah, and how they, you know, how, how you could uh, make fun uh, of, of some things. Obviously, you were not able to make fun in comedies in the 70s uh, from the system openly or from um, the government itself, high government. You were only always able to make fun uh, from like little things. But uh, Barea, right after Pivovsky uh, and his The Cruz, were the first ones who really changed that. In the 70s, it was a little bit uh, easier. Uh, the the so social, socialism or communists wanted to pretend that it's more human. Um, uh, and the, the, they started, the people in the government started to care about the, how they were perceived by the West. So um, more things were um, able to be shown. Also, comedies were always even better to show um, satire of, of the government because they were not taken seriously. So whatever wasn't possible to be said in a normal feature a serious film uh, was easier to, to, to be shown in a comedy. Uh, each comedy, though, and each film back then uh, had to be um, first read by uh, the censors uh, on the script level. And then it has to be decided, you know, some scenes were um, taken off. And then uh, when the film was ready, they would watch it again, again, recommend to take some scenes off. Uh, those recommendations were... Well, you, you had no choice, obviously. Uh, Marek Pivovsky, for example, after making The Cruise, didn't make another film for uh, six or seven years. Uh, because if you didn't uh, listen, then you would um, have problems with working again. But it all depends. It depends, uh, you know, on the situation. You might have uh, one meeting, they say it's not good, but then the next one, there are different people, different opinions and they might let you go with some scenes that um, at first were supposed to be cut off. Uh, the directors who worked in those times also um, remember that uh, they had those ways of uh, kind of playing a game with the censors. Um, so for example, they would say, they would write a scene that they knew was too much and the censors would not be able uh, to let it go. So they would kind of uh, put it there to attract their attention to that scene. And then this way, maybe they wouldn't, uh, you know, see something smaller somewhere else and let that go this way. It was the same later with, with the film being made. The money was not a problem. They could shoot as long as they wanted. So that was never, you know, that was never a, a, an issue. Uh, so they would make some scenes that they knew because censors had um, kind of uh, directives. They, they had a list of things that they were not allowed to show or they were not allowed to be said from the screen. Uh, but the directors were always one step ahead. 
So they knew what things they cannot get away with, but they would always try uh, new things. And before the sensors catch up with that, they would already have another ideas. And also with time, they learned to use the Aesopian language and their public learned to read it. Um, so they knew every film is a symbol of something or everything in that film is always a symbol of political uh, uh, situation. Everything was very, very politicalized back then. So let me just mention as well the last thing about this film. It's a cult film in Poland, which means it has a cult base. And there's a big group of people who watch it over and over again. And practically all Barea films, there are forums and uh, Facebook groups uh, of people who, who love him so much um, that they only use his quotes uh, in everyday life. Uh, and they know all of his films uh, practically by heart. So uh, for a film to become cult, it takes time though. Mm, so it's never a film that was just released that is a cult. It always takes some uh, few decades, the best. Um, uh, and right now, uh, the uh, cult fan base of, of Barea is, is really, really strong. He's actually the most famous, the second most famous cult uh, films uh, director after um, Piwowski, which is funny because Piwowski only made one cult film, but it's the biggest and the best, the one we watched yesterday. Uh, Barea made more of them. Mm, each of them was better and better. Uh, people say that the, the, the peak of his career was the teddy bear, but to be able to appreciate it, we have to go see the way he went through. Uh, so today we will watch the first of his films, and then uh, in, in three days from now, we will watch uh, the teddy bear and you will see how it changed the satire because this film uh, again if you watch the cruise yesterday with us you will see that it's completely different it's in color first of all but also uh, uh, everything here is scripted there are only um, professional actors so unlike the cruise which was completely different uh, this one uh, was very very well uh, thought through Again, the, the censors uh, didn't like it that much. So at first they made just a few copies. Later there was more made. They would, uh, I mentioned yesterday, the way to censor a film was also by not showing it in many cinemas, not advertising it. And another way was what was actually very often happening in case of Barea, uh, he would get very bad reviews. So even if the film was uh, released, uh, they didn't want too many people to see it. So they would write that it was not good. But we see a big change between his films from the 60s and this one who was the first one when he started to make fun of communism for the first time and then from now on. Um, so now he's very appreciated. Unfortunately, he was not uh, alive when the system changed. He died in 1987, two years before the fall of the communism. He was uh, very involved in the solidarity movement. Um, nobody knew back then. Uh, we only found out later after his death that he was actually bringing um, forbidden books from, from the West. He even brought one photocopier, which was uh, in a very high demand back then in Poland, because this way uh, uh, books or newspapers, underground books and newspapers could be uh, copied and distributed. He even started uh, one of those forbidden newspapers called Strache na Lache, in which him and other uh, of his friends uh, would write text against the government. So people didn't know about it uh, for a very long time. Now we know that he was fighting with the system, not only through his films, uh, but also in, in real life. Uh, and uh, he, he usually surely helped to, uh, to make it dissolve. Unfortunately, he didn't live long enough uh, to see it, as I mentioned. Uh, just one more thing. Um, I mentioned that his films are um, cult films, and uh, you, could, uh, you, you might think that it's only people who, who uh, remember those times that watch it and rewatch it just to you know, feel better that now it's all gone. But it's actually a, a new generation, people born after the system watch it as well. 
and they love it. They just don't believe this was the, the reality. So we don't watch them because of something called nostalgia. Uh, the name comes from Eastern Germany, and now it means uh, nostalgia for the Eastern Bloc that is um, happening in some countries of the Eastern Bloc. Uh, it's more um, to appreciate that the system has changed. And uh, I am able to say that because I did a questionnaire between people who watch those films and asked them if they would like to live in the reality we see on the screen. And they all said that even some of them obviously say they did and they wouldn't want to go back. And others say that no, that I would know that would be the case. That's not why they watch those films. Uh, why do they watch it then? Well, you will have to see and, uh, yourself and find out. Um, so we're gonna talk more about that um, after the film. Uh, please remember you can ask the questions during the, the film or right after, uh, put them in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. So right now I will send you through the chat box. Uh, I will send you the link. Please let me know if you can see it. Um, okay, so it should be there. And now I'm gonna also copy the password. And now the password is there. So you have to click on that link um, to open the film and then put that password in. I'm not getting any feedback. I don't know if you can see it or not. The fact that nobody's saying that you can't is a good news, I guess. Okay, now I have the confirmation that you can. So yes, um, before you go, let me just uh, remind you one more time. You have uh, one hour and a half. The film is one hour and 22 minutes. So please uh, watch it, have a quick break, and then come back uh, in exactly uh, yeah, one hour and a half uh, back here to this window, and we will have a, a, a Q&A. I hope you will have a lot of questions. I said it yesterday and I will say it every day. There are no stupid questions. There are only stupid answers. And me having experience teaching for a very long time, uh, I don't think you can surprise me with any question anymore. So please go watch the film and see you back in one hour and a half. I hope you will enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs>